Um, so um, we're really excited to have um, a conversation today about labs sitting in amongst the kind of a whole spectrum of calls that have kind of touched on the kind of work that labs do and their role in learning about problems. We just came off the back of a session about setting up a learning organization, which was based on the work of 91 labs connected around the world to try and operate as a kind of network. Um, and later on this evening, we've got another call, which is looking at kind of uh, creating social R&D ecosystems, which in a way is kind of a spin on how a groups of people can work together to learn together on the kind of issues that matter. Um, this sits as part of a festival kind of come uh, working out loud space called Working Progress because it's unfinished business. And this is a kind of, uh, just like a, a nice a nice space for people to share the stuff that may not be fully polished and has probably still got its rough edges and unknowns and um, both the thanks to all our amazing speakers for sharing in that in that uh, in that regard as well as our audience for um, being kind and thoughtful listeners. Um, so I'm not going to waffle on any more um, other than to say. Stefan has kindly pulled this together and has the reins from um, from now on. Uh, thank you all for coming. Cheers. Thank you, James. Uh, hi, everybody. It's uh, really nice to see you all. Um, yes, we had in mind um, to, to have this conversation about labs because lab is definitely something that is work in progress, never finished. Uh, some, say that, some say that they are finished. Uh, but we believe they are not, but uh, there are conditions uh, for, for their, their future. Um, so maybe, um, uh, maybe we can, I can share my screen. Yep. Um, so yes, the question is uh, um, um, what to do with these, uh, with, with these labs. And for this conversation, we will have, um, I will introduce uh, Mathias Bejan. Uh, with an associate professor at uh, Gustave Eiffel Management School, and who works a lot on uh, uh, his, his work is based on experimental uh, thinking, experimental governance, and labs. He works a lot on living labs. And Lindsay Cole, um, uh, which is the head of the city of uh, Vancouver Solutions Lab, but who, who has also done uh, just done a, a thesis in a, um, in a uh, a few months ago, uh, and she's uh, uh, she's um, uh, specialized in public policy and uh, adult education. Um, so maybe just to tell you the uh, the plan, um, we, I, I will just say a few words about why we we think it's important to have this debate about labs um, and and make a kind of diagnosis. Uh, then we will have a conversation with Lindsay and Matthias uh, during 30 minutes. You will have the possibility. Um, you you will have the possibility to interact and and, and write comments on my slides uh, during the conversation with uh, Lindsay and Matthias. But you will have time to uh, and the possibility to ask your own question uh, during 15 minutes, and then we will stop uh, and we will have a five minute conclusion. So it's just an appetizer. We don't have the time to, to dig uh, 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 too far, but uh, I hope it will uh, um, uh, give you uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, great inspiration uh, for, for the future. Um, so maybe if I try in a few words to set the scene of labs, um, I, I like to say that labs is a very good vehicle for public innovation and public transformation because we did not find a better one for the moment, or we've got other vehicles, but this one is, looks like the one that uh, national government, local, whatever your size as a government. Uh, I think in France, we've got very small cities who build their own labs, uh, medium cities, metropolitan areas. We've got uh, um, at the European level, the, 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 the European Commission has his own, his own lab uh, since years. So everybody create labs. It's, uh, it's uh, the, really the, the preferred uh, tools or uh, stuff uh, created in, by the, in the, the public innovation community. But if we are honest uh, with labs uh, until now, uh, we can say, um, and 
I don't always say it in, in such cruel words, but uh, uh, I, I know that uh, we, I am with, uh, with my community, so I, I can be, uh, we can be all uh, honest with that, but uh, um, probably labs have uh, failed to change the game, to be game changer uh, until now for various reasons. Um, uh, one of the reasons is that they, they tend to be uh, what I would call one-shot delivery units that don't really challenge a dominant paradigm. Uh, and, and if they don't challenge it, it probably means that most of the times they, they reinforce them. Uh, so they have no natural effect. And I think this is something we must have in mind that uh, like any kind of innovation, device, tool, solutions, uh, they, they don't have natural effect and we must uh, um, care with the fact that if, if they, they don't do good, they can do bad uh, and uh, uh, um, make even some situation worse. Uh, uh, so this is the first reason. The second reason is that, as we all know, most of them are stuck by limited resource uh, skills. Uh, Sometimes they speak about design, but with no designer, or they speak about data, but there is no data scientist. And so they, 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 they don't always, always have the level of skills uh, required. They, they don't have times. Uh, and sometimes it's strange to think that they don't have the possibility to think in the long term. Uh, they must deliver quickly, most of the time, in a few months, uh, and they don't have much power. Uh, and uh, the consequence is that they have uh, limited outputs. I think we are, uh, the glass is uh, both uh, full and empty. I mean, in, on, of course they, they, they produce outputs, but uh, most of the outputs are not finished, not uh, all ambitious or, or at a small scale. Um, another problem is that they, they, don't, uh, uh, they don't equip uh, with enough reflexivity documentation. They don't really capitalize because they got no time and no resource to do it. Uh, they don't really care about ethics. I have not, I did not read much about ethics of lab the, uh, these years. So uh, um, uh, I, I probably, it's probably missing. Uh, they, 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 they don't really cooperate. Uh, they try to, to, to build partnership uh, internally and externally, but it's not really, uh, uh, ambitious cooperation, and they don't really think in terms of their governance, which means uh, who decides, who pays, uh, who runs, who, who takes the decision at the end. Uh, they, they, many of them are focused on the methodology, on the techniques, on the tools, but they don't reinterrogate re their governance and the power uh, will decide what is the lab and what it's supposed to do. And um, of course, lab is a business uh, and it's good, uh, but it's also bad because it means that there is the pressure of the market. Uh, there is a trend to innovation washing and storytelling. And uh, I realized uh, in 10 years, how labs have become a soft power for diplomacy. Uh, let me tell you, for instance, how we, we spend some time with uh, the civil servant from country like uh, Albania or Georgia, who are apply, uh, they are applying to be part of European Commission, but the European Commission says, hey guys, if you want to be part of European, European Union, you got to have a, a, a good administration uh, and notably you got to have a lab. Uh, so labs tend to be, and, and if you think about the partnership between uh, the mine lab a few years ago with the Brazil, uh, be, between the Denmark and the Brazil, uh, the, there was a, a partnership for the, which say that the Brazil pays uh, the Denmark to have its own lab. Uh, so it's not nuclear plants or it's, it's, it's labs. Uh, so labs has become um, a part of the soft power uh, and the diplomatic tools. So it's interesting, but it's, it's, not, um, uh, it's not a factor of success uh, for, for labs themselves. So, um, to, to have this to, to explore and to dig into this uh, this uh, issue of uh, of lab, um, I have prepared just a few questions for you, Lindsay, and you, Matthias. So you are it's just a, a platform of question. It's just a, a, a starting point, uh, and and we can challenge the question uh, uh, progressively. But uh, maybe the first one would be 
Um, do you agree on the diagnosis that uh, um, there is an issue with uh, innovation, fake innovation, uh, uh, just like fake news, uh, uh, and maybe uh, uh, um, sometime I, I wonder if we should be less polite now uh, and consider that innovation washing and, and uh, lack of ethics and uh, the risk of disconnecting uh, uh, innovation and politics and, and to ignore uh, that innovation is not neutral is really part of the, the challenge now and that, that we must be uh, more active on this. Uh, what, what do you think, uh, uh, Lindsay, on this? I think it's part of your work and, and it's one of the reasons why you, you have launched your, uh, your research and done your, your thesis. Am I right? Yeah, thanks, Stefan. That's a, such a such a hot one to start with. So, um, uh, thanks for that question. And uh, I just wanted to say hello here from the west coast of Canada near Vancouver. Um, a flicker, a northern flicker, just landed right outside my window just as we started. So that's a good. I'll take that as a good omen. Um, Google northern flicker. It's a really beautiful bird that arrives here in the winter. So coming in from these beautiful lands and territories. So I think. Um, what comes to mind for me, Stefan, when you ask that combination of questions is, is, um, is the, I think the particular, like something quite specific about labs that are in the public sector. Like here in Canada, we have this, this network and ecosystem of social innovation labs and they live in different sectors, um, only, only some of which are in the public sector. So it's interesting because we have this sort of array of things that call themselves social innovation labs that operate in really different ways. And I think the ones in the, the public sector are particularly at risk for some of the things that you're talking about if they're really only beholden to themselves. So if if there there's this thinking that I really like from a, someone named Michelle Lee Moore who writes in social innovation space as a researcher and a practitioner, and she talks about this idea of, of um, social innovations kind of and where they're positioned within the system that they're trying to change. So if there's something that calls itself a social innovation is exists entirely within the organization or the system or the problem space um, that it is trying to change, then it's pretty likely that it's going to get co-opted by the dominant forces within that system. It's really difficult for a public sector lab that tends to be, no matter how well resourced and funded they might be, is still really marginal um, compared to the dominant systems and structures of power and decision making and politics at play uh, in public sector labs. So. Are there different kinds of accountabilities that we might um, imagine where a lab is, you know, uh, even if it's its main purpose is to try and influence what's happening in the public sector, that it has a wider range of accountabilities, that it free it up from those political cycles from the, and from those kind of those pressures of the, of the dominant regime that it's a part of. I'll leave it there maybe to start and see if um, Matthias wants to add to that or say something else. Matthias, do you see this kind of dominant uh, culture um, uh, th that is there and that labs should not, should not underestimate? Yeah, no, I, I share your, your, your dialogue and, um, and uh, what, uh, what Lindsay I just said. It's, um, but I believe that your question was also about um, depolitization uh, of labs, meaning that uh, when we are talking about labs, everybody is happy to, to join the team and say, but then when we are really entering the collective work, there are some tensions, conflicts, sometimes even in, in social innovation, or maybe <laughs> above all, <laughs> when we are talking about social innovation, I mean, real social innovation. And sometimes these tensions and conflicts, they are either overlooked or uh, reduced to psychological you know, effects, meaning oh, they, are not, they don't have trust in, uh, in the decision makers or they don't have trust in I don't know what. But in many, many situations, these uh, conflicts or tensions, they, but it's a really classic social science, huh? they express, uh, in fact, uh, a distribution of power or I don't know, or or themes that are not that not have been raised by the, the initial, I mean, brief design brief, and it expressed that there are uh, people that were, were not able to express 
a point of view, a difficulties, or simply a reality. And it remembers me um, the work of uh, Robert Chambers. And Robert Chambers is, uh, uh, so he was at the University of Sussex, uh, I, I believe, and, but he wrote a, a book uh, entitled Whose Reality Counts? And it's about uh, giving voice to the voiceless. It's about recognizing that when we are assessing or uh, something or discussing, or organizing a collective work, often we don't in integrate and the point of view, the voices of many, many uh, people. And maybe it's, uh, it's uh, when, you, when you say that uh, the, there is a problem of depolitization in, with the labs, it is because uh, we over psychologize <laughs> the, the conflicts and, and we disregard uh, consciously or unconsciously the fact that um, the reality that we want to work on um, it reflects when we say this is the reality it reflects a distribution or balance of power and uh, and maybe this is something that is not absent but um, uh, insufficiently treated in the in the labs mm -hmm. today but technically what would be your your vision i mean a few years ago it was very um, uh, we, we say labs are must go under the radar and they must change the things uh, uh, as um, I don't know the, the uh, chameleons, you know. I mean, they they must adapt uh, and and not be exactly uh, clear about what they are because uh, yeah, they are doing like hackers, you know. Uh, and we talk about friendly hackers. Uh, um, uh, is it always true now, uh, Lindsay? Do you think that uh, labs must be under the radar, or, or do you think that they must? Um, be more, I mean, I think it was one of the things you say, it's that they, they must uh, give up with that and be more clear about their their values, their, uh, as Mathias said, I mean, the, about the fact that they are there to uh, tackle the conflicts exactly. uh, uh, and not just being uh, kind uh, people. Um, what, in terms of strategy, what would you say, Lindsay, now? Is, is it just that the, the new generation of labs should be more explicit, more activist in a way, or uh, th does this uh, under the radar strategy keep, is still good? Mm. I think, um, I get, I think what comes to mind for me, Stefan, is that we, is that I think we, as practitioners and thinkers in these spaces need to need more, a wider variety of ways that we think about that. Like there's some agility required as conditions change. So, you know, elected elections happen, senior civil servants change, departments get reorganized, new people get hired, new issues become priorities of the day in your community or in your state or at your country level or at the international level. And I think that the way that the thing called a lab intervenes in those systems needs to skillfully adapt to those conditions as well. I think that the I think that the kind of hacker ideas are outdated. I think there's also evidence that that hasn't really worked to change systems and structures and minds and skills over time. Maybe it had its time when it was important for these disruptions to happen to just sort of wake the system, wake these organizations up a little bit. Um, but I don't think that that strategy lasts in all or that strategy works in all situations when you're when you're actually trying to say make real pro like where, where I'm working we're trying to really make real progress on climate change and equity and decolonization issues and you can't do that in a way where you're just kind of coming in and shaking things up for the long term so I think um, we need different different tool different tools and strategies and, and theories of change I think we'll talk about that a bit later about like what it is that you're doing and why and I think one other thing I just wanted to say about um, something that Matthias said about um, sort of this idea of engaging with power is that um, is that it still feels like a lot of a lot of the way the ways in which labs talk about their val the value that they're offering is still using the sort of common language around creating public value, making government more um, accessible, available, responsive to what people need. And I think that 
that's true in some cases, but in, in, for, again, in my work, if you follow that through, then it, it means that lab, there's a danger that labs actually uphold the dominant systems and structures of power that are creating a lot of these problems at the foundational level. So if we just continue to talk about ourselves in the, in the ways that government usually says, like, we're here for you and we're creating public value and follow along with that sort of um, higher level kind of bigger picture ambition and purpose of government, I think sometimes that doesn't work for labs as a, as a foundational purpose. So even though it's legible to the bigger organization to use language in that way, it often means that we're not really making a difference with some of the, some of the things that we're trying to work on. Before we shift to the, the next question, I see comments that show that uh, when I read them, I, th I think we must admit that labs are more ecosystem of labs. Uh, some of them are inside government, some of them are outside, uh, but I think we are talking about the same ecosystem of labs. If we consider lab just as an innovation department, we don't understand this. We don't really have the, the vision of the, uh, the role of consultancy, of external uh, uh, labs, internal labs, etc. I think we are more talking about uh, ecosystem. But let's shift to the other question, because I think you both uh, care about theory. Um, I must admit that when I, when I uh, I had to deal with that. When I read first your your papers, didn't say I was I was I find it interesting because the 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 characteristic of a lab is is to being doers. I mean they they are it's uh, the administration is to be supposed to be like an ocean and and there is nothing happening in terms of innovation, and labs are supposed to be the one that break uh, the statu quo and 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 do things. And, but, but what you say in your work, and I think that Matthias say, says too, uh, uh, and because he's also a researcher, is that uh, uh, there is no sense of doing things without articulating with theories. Uh, and, and, and I think you suggest that um, in the future, labs would be more powerful if they, uh, if they are more theoric. Can you elaborate on that, uh, either Matthias or Lindsay, uh, as, as, as you want? But I, I think Lindsay, it's part of your, your thesis, so maybe we can start with, uh, with Lindsay, if Matthias is okay. Sure, I can start. Um, so as I, so in, my, in my research, I had the pleasure and gift of talking with lots of folks like Stefan, uh, mostly in Canada and Europe, practitioners who are who are thinking in this space and, and trying to figure out um, what it, you know what it, what it, what a public sector innovation labs about what do they mean what are they trying to do and, and how do they enact that and I think I found that often they weren't they had working theories of change so ideas about how change works uh, and then ideas about what their lab was doing to contribute to that change and then their activities and tools and techniques sort of flowed from that sometimes those were uh, explicit, but often not. They were more implicit and not sort of named and described and critiqued and evaluated to see if they were actually serving what it was that um, the lab was trying to do. So I feel like that's an, it's, I say easy, it's not necessarily easy, but I think it's pretty straightforward and obvious thing that we can all do to make it much clearer what it, how we think change happens and what it is that our lab is doing to try and contribute to that change. Um, because then we can we can be we can under we can use that within our own lab teams in order to you know work that out wrestle that out you know some people think that change happens by changing individual minds some people think that it happens by adding skills some people that think that it happens by making big disruptions some people think that it happens by changing culture and organizations and there's valid and interesting and robust bodies of work around all the those ideas about how change happens and I think that labs can get much more skillful about um, how we how we integrate that into mm. our practice. Matthias, when I told you, I remember when I told you about, uh, for instance, the theory of change uh, that that Lindsay suggests. You told me, well, oh, this is an old thing. We it's it's very it's very known in the uh, innovation uh, uh, era that that this is a basis. Uh, so, is it so obvious that innovation must be theorized? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well, well, I remember this discussion, but uh, uh, I told you that that's true. That to me it was um, was ba yeah basis because uh, I remember when I was a student uh, in master student, I was studying theory of change. It was in two two thousand four, so this is only because uh, of my own experience. But uh, 
it was, it was, so uh, does it does it mean that it, it takes job. time? Is it time from uh, academic to uh, to implementation for yeah, a practitioner? In, yeah, sure. But in any you know in any any field of knowledge, it's uh, it, it takes time. Yeah, for research to you know to diffuse to disseminate in, within uh, the society in general. And and uh, but but this is maybe an, another question. But maybe to to answer your wider question on um, the role of theories, theory and theories within the labs, uh, I, I'm not sure, but I, I might I might say that there is or there are three levels, three different levels because you can have theories like you say, like theory of change, theory of uh, evaluation. Like for example, also the realistic uh, evaluation that I like a lot from Rob, uh, Ray Poisson and uh, Nick Tilly, for example, uh, but also Michael Patton, you know, uh, or I don't know, Fetterman uh, on the you know, empowerment evaluation. So there, there are a lot of really a lot of evaluation theories that might, yeah, that might prove of uh, prove. Uh, of interest uh, for labs, but that's the first level. But I would say it's an intermediate level because uh, below you can have theories also on the social phenomena that you that labs are trying to to understand. If you want to, for example, if you want to assess the, a level of appropriation, a level of adoption from users, you have to have <laughs> a theory of adoption or appropriation, and often. These theories, I mean, linked to uh, the, the, the concrete issues that you are exploring, uh, also are, are not really equipped, like you said before in the introduction. Uh, it means that sometimes the kind of reflection that we have, and it's also, it's also connected what, uh, to what you were saying about depolitization, it's a, um, a simplification. Because you want to to deliver, as you said in the introduction, um, you know findings, results, uh, and sometimes it simplifies, but not always. But sometimes simplifies the 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 phenomena themselves that uh, the lab wants to to explore. And so this this is another level. This 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 is the not the theory. Um, I mean, on the methods or methodology of, of the labs, but uh, the theory uh, of the research or or, uh, uh, differently said, this is how research and social science might help uh, explore theme, you know, within the labs. It connects to R and D, you know, the, your social R and D, maybe, yeah? uh, because I, I know that you like uh, the, this concept. And there is a third level, and the last one, which is theorizing on the lab. I mean, what is this new way of organizing, you know? Uh, this exploration of uh, values and knowledge, because it's not only knowledge, it's also values. And, uh, and this, uh, I believe that this is lacking today to understand or to develop an epistemological point of view on the lab. I know that Lindsay uh, has already reflected a lot in, uh, in his uh, her dissertation uh, yeah, on that point, but I believe that we, we need to be, uh, you know, a, a bunch of, <laughs> of social and uh, another scientist uh, working on that that uh, that problem, and so yeah, the the level of epistemological, uh, you know, epistemological status of the labs and the knowledge produced in the labs, then uh, the theories on evaluation, and method, etc., and below, uh, but very important thing, the 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 R and D, you know, the the, the theories. Uh, helping to understand, give form to the phenomena, social phenomena uh, that we, that they want and that we want to explore in the labs. Yeah, some, someone is asking, what is the ratio between doing and reflecting? I think someone is afraid that reflecting takes too much time. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not, I, I believe it's not the ratio, but it's the reason. <laughs> it's not the ratio, the reason. <laughs> yeah, the reason. If you go fast, you can uh, have a, a very good ratio. <laughs> but <laughs> Lindsay, what would you say about this uh, idea of reflection, uh, reflexivity, etc.? Because really, you work. I mean, I, I must admit that I know more about your reflexivity than on the work of your labs. Uh, 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 so I have no idea of what you're doing exactly on what are the topic. And the, I mean, uh, uh, it's a bit cruel, but uh, through your work, I think I know more about the question, the research question you ask, 
than the, the, the work of your lab. Sorry for this uh, naughty uh, question, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's the nature of like studying your work in this way too, right? Um, I was just going to add, maybe Stefan, I was I, as you were as you opened us up with some, your sort of diagnosis of the or this kind of state of the field, you know, labs as main, you know, um, remaining somewhat marginal, um, working with limited resources, like stuck in this tension of quick delivery instead of longer term change. Um, the reflection and evaluation question, how they are engaging with power and governance, all these things. Um, I think the, the constraint is that a lot of labs are trying to address all of these things in the problem spaces that they're, they're working on in the still, even though they're using some different tools and techniques in the way in their creative processes, working with stakeholders and partners, they're still working within this dominant system and ways of working that um, government imposes on them, which I think is resulting in some of those characteristics that you were describing. And so if they can make a bit more room for themselves, even in a couple of those ways, say around governance or how they're engaging with power, to bring in a different theory of change and some different theories informing the approach um, that mm -hmm. labs are taking, then maybe there are some some um, different things that might result, so that we kind of can get out of some of these traps that a lot of us are that a mm -hmm. lot of us are in. Before we shift to the to the other question, someone asked, "Would do you think does a good job for this?" Uh, I, I would say that at the, by the moment it's Lindsay, uh, and I su strongly suggest that you read on Medium. Maybe Lindsay, you could. Uh, copy your link in the, the chat, but uh, um, the, the work done by the Solutions Lab uh, with this community, because it's not only Solutions Lab, it's a, a bunch of uh, labs in uh, Canada and everywhere. Uh, I really think this is uh, one of the most interesting, uh, uh, even a bit disturbing uh, work, because we talk about labs on feminism, uh, labs and uh, uh, decolonization, and uh, it's very, uh, uh, it's a very, I think, very interesting work. So I, I strongly uh, suggest that for those who, of you who don't know the the, the work of uh, the Solutions Lab on Lindsay, that you read the the Medium, uh, uh, the blog on Medium. That is very. Uh, uh, you have read four or five uh, uh, blogs on Medium that are very uh, inspiring. Uh, maybe next. I'll just I'll, yeah. I'll add too that like we just we just heard um, Baz and Gina from the UNDP Accelerator Labs Network this morning, and they're I mean they're very much in the space of reflecting and on their learning as they're building this network, this massive scale, um, this network of learning in the lab space, and so mm -hmm. watch that recording when it comes out too. Like that was yeah. that just yeah. happened an hour ago. Whether you're okay with this work or not okay, it's it's really really inspiring. I mean, uh, so I, I strongly suggest to to read it. The the third question was, um, uh, and I think it's something that Matthias uh, knows uh, uh, much. Is uh, we we know now that if labs want to be more to have more impact, as we say, uh, they won't do it alone. So uh, there is a, an emergency in a way for labs to. Uh, build a strong uh, partnership with the uh, older government uh, for uh, first and maybe uh, but also uh, um, uh, academic uh, research uh, and universities and schools and and companies and cooperatives and so on and uh, this is something that Matthias you have studied notably in the not exactly in public innovation but in the field of uh, medical technology you you said that you've seen this kind of ecosystem growing those uh, last years yeah yeah that's true so um when i when i said that uh, i'm studying labs in fact i'm mostly studying living labs and living labs are particular lab, labs so they, they try to innovate sure but they also try to to assess to so to evaluate solution in real life and to gather a collect uh, concrete and real life data so if they are concerned by experiential knowledge. <clears throat> and when they want to do so, it's very difficult for them to be a general uh, lab working on you know, any uh, type of uses or, or, or questions. So they, they are, they are uh, focused on uh, area of expertise, let's say, uh, and they, they have partners and they have uh, uh, users they work with and so, they cannot be generalists at all. They have 
some generic knowledge, but they can be generalist at all. And, and then this explained that, uh, for instance, when they in the med tech sector, when they want to assess the potential of um, technological solution, they cannot do the old, uh, it's re really rare, but it's possible, but it's rare that they, they might do the old you know, uh, process from uh, the, the first analysis of fuses and to the industrialization. So they need to have partners, they need to have a, a lot of uh, different uh, uh, stakeholders coming in. And uh, first of all, the users, for example, in the, in, uh, as far as the living labs are, are concerned, they, they work with uh, hospitals, they work with, uh, you know, with um, uh, structures for the elder, uh, elderly uh, one, uh, ones you know, uh, and, uh, and so on. So they, they need to have partners uh, at each step in a way. And, uh, and uh, this is why I, I studied the, the ecosystems and I, uh, and I came to, to, yeah, to use this concept, which is problematic because uh, ecosystem comes from the biology, from, from biology and, and sometimes it's, you know, it, uh, yeah, yeah, there is a lot of, uh, of things that, comes, that, come, that come with uh, the imaginary of biology, like the species, like uh, survival of the fetus, which are not maybe, you know, applicable to uh, a social uh, ecosystem. And, uh, but uh, the, the interest of this concept is to, yeah, to insist, to emphasize the, um, the relationships uh, beyond the, the actors. So this is the relationships, interdependencies, and, uh, and the fact that resources are distributed on a territory, for example. And uh, so this is what, what I have studied. And, uh, and the labs, the living labs, which are successful, are the living labs which are able to develop an ecosystem uh, projects uh, after projects. So one, for example, project will bring uh, partners, and then another one will bring the you know uh, other partners, etc. But they, they kept on or they keep on working uh, with these partners, and they try, I say, they try to, as you say in the in the introduction, to integrate them in the governance of, of the living lab in order to yeah. To, to build trust and uh, long-term relationships, et cetera. Mm. Well, this is just a, uh, yeah, mm. In, observation. Say, do you know this situation? Because I think you got a partnership with the University of uh, New Columbia, if I'm right, uh, but it's only one partner. Uh, why do you think there is so few uh, uh, ambitious and large cooperation between you know, public innovation labs on, and the rest of the society and the and researcher and, and other government and so on like like uh, some some says research and development infrastructure i mean uh, uh, so the, the whole ecosystem ranking from uh, starting from research and and, and going till development of a solution uh, um, how do you explain that yeah, I, I think a couple things come to mind for me, Stefan. So, so with my with more of my practitioner hat on working in one lab in one city, then there's so many things that we have to do in our one city to just keep going, let alone do something that matters. But it's really difficult even sometimes to take time to have conversations like the one we're having today to like put your head up and look around and and see what else is going on out there. So what, especially, I think they're in the early stages of a lab, you do a lot of that. You're trying to see like who else has done what and what have they, what's resulted from their work and how can I pick up what's working and kind of run with it. But then once you get going, you're really so consumed by the, the pressures that you have inside your own organization and the work that you're doing that's really difficult um, to, to do that. And I think in Canada, I think this is different in different places, but here there isn't really like we're just starting to see some of the organizations that are already in place to serve to that are, that are network serving organizations in my case i'm working mostly in municipalities and regional governments they're not really thinking about this yet they're not like they're still working themselves in some fairly more traditional like we offer capacity building programs in sort of skills building right around asset management or around different climate change related programs and, and, you know, different policy and regulatory spaces. So sort of traditional professional development. Um, 
and they're not really entering into this into this space of seeing what it means to support innovation and experimentation and, and um, you know, working differently on, on complex challenges. So the network serving organizations themselves are not moving into this space. So I think that's different in different countries and different states, like in what you're doing in France is really different than what's happening here in Canada, but there just isn't, there isn't that investment really in, in supporting ecosystem scale efforts in a, in a lot of cases and what I'm seeing anyway. My last question before we open the floor to, uh, uh, to the audience is uh, uh, the idea that we've got very limited imaginaries of our clubs. We, we mostly see them as delivery uh, uh, consultancy uh, agencies and so um, what, what strikes me, uh, what really, uh, really like with uh, the solution labs is when you talk about the solution lab, let's say you talk about, you, you make a reference to the uh, 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 um, to the native uh, Canadians uh, uh, and the, 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 the people living there before, and that you, you describe the lab as something that is there to care about the land, just as uh, uh, the, the uh, Native American uh, North Canada. Uh, I don't I, I don't say I, I don't know how you say. Is it uh, you say uh, <laughs> uh, you say Native Canadian? Indigenous. Like, Indigenous, okay. So you, you describe the lab as, uh, just as Indigenous did, uh, care about the land, care about... Uh, so I think it's a very nice and interesting narrative that says things about the role of the lab, a lab who repairs, a lab who care, which is totally different from a lab who is looking for performance or what this kind of thing. Um, uh, do you think that the, there is a, a way to... Uh, develop this kind of work on narratives about labs, uh, of new narratives about labs? Yeah, so I think um, through, as I was kind of doing my own work in the solutions lab and also th through the research, I got really curious about, or was feeling really constrained by the dominant paradigm of governance that we hold in this country and many other settler colonial nations. We just sort of think that government looks a certain way, it operates with a certain set of values and mindsets about what it is and what it is not. And like, it's fixed, like it's always been that way. And um, here in, in Canada, in so-called Canada, there's this, there's, there are many, many other forms of governance here that are much older than that and are resurgent in the, on the landscape. I think this is happening in New Zealand too. You can really see the work in the um, Auckland co-design lab is really being informed more by Indigenous ways of knowing and being in the ways that they're conceiving of what it is that they're trying to do as a lab. And so I'm not an Indigenous person. I'm a settler working inside a very colonial institution. And in that, got curious about like framing up what a different paradigm of governance might be as a way to think about what a lab is trying to, to do. So it, there's one of the frameworks that came out of the research when I was talking with people about, um, you know, things like leadership and enabling conditions for innovation turned into this idea about like paradigms of governance that we might need to move away from that are fixed and sort of problematic and aspects of a paradigm of governance for transformative, emergent, resurgent innovation that we wanna to move toward. And so moving toward are things like inclusive and just you know, paradigms and not continuing to be okay with white dominant systems and structures and ways of thinking about our work. Or um, so, so that's kind of how that, how that is playing out in my thinking of my work. And for me in the solutions lab, like we're work, it's, it's very direct because the policy domains that we're working in are around, are around the, our green, our environment plan, our healthy city plan, city of reconciliation, equity framework. So like you can't actually, in my view, work on those things in a way that's, more significant than making kind of incremental changes unless you're also questioning the paradigms of governance within which you're working. Mm. Matthias, in a paper that you wrote a few weeks ago, you also uh, suggest at the end of this paper, new narratives for labs. You said that they could be uh, labs for creation. And you also said that they could, like in the 17th century, like being openers. C can, you, can you elaborate a bit? We don't have your, your mic is uh, off. I'm sorry, I was listening to Lindsay, so uh, <laughs> I like to, to listen to her. Uh, 
but uh, yes, yeah, the, the word I use is uh, ouvroir in, in French. Ouvroir, it's very difficult to translate it in, in English, even for native speaker, you know, because I know that from my translator, <laughs> Uh, who is Welsh, <laughs> and uh, uh, because ouvroir in French, it means to open, so, so this is a place, a workroom, uh, in which you can, so you can work, but also uh, it sounds like opening, like openers, but openers in English, I, I know that it's, uh, it sounds a bit uh, strange. So this is, these are places to, to work, to play, and to, to open new ways yeah, of, of doing or thinking things. Uh, yeah, the things, and uh, and when I said that, it's because I believe that uh, if we if we take seriously the labs uh, of today and today's labs, so innovation labs or living labs, uh, it might be a, a way of moving from a, a strictly experimental uh, view or narrative of what what is a laboratory taken from the nineteenth century to a new way of understanding what is experiment, experimenting, but also experiencing, experiencing a, a transformation. So we are moving from an experimental approach to maybe, maybe to a transformative approach. It's already there because, for example, when you, you take the theories of uh, Fetterman, Patton, etc., they, they they talk about uh, participation, transformation, innovation in you know the new way of. Uh, uh, managing the public innovation or thing like that and uh, but it maybe it's it's um, it is uh, we have still to to write this new narrative of uh, this is also connected to open science i mean to uh, if we take the lab uh, laboratory seriously on the question of knowledge in society maybe we have to write a narrative in which science is um, is, is, is not only uh, as, because I, I remember the first comment comment on uh, the ratio between uh, theory and practice or between uh, uh, thinking and doing. So maybe this is this question. It's not only you know looking and observing uh, things and thinking and theorizing uh, from it, but also transforming uh, you know uh, our, our territories or you know. Or social spaces, etc., mm -hmm. and this is this might require a different narrative <laughs> or view or imaginary of the laboratory within the society, and maybe what what Lindsay is experimenting and experiencing is a, a, a lab who is also a kind of micro society in a way. You know, you know, it's kind of it's very difficult today to to make or to to experience the society as a whole, because you know there is a, there are a lot of tensions, sure, uncertainty, and but so we 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 feel like you know a, a fragmented society. But if we manage to have uh, to build uh, micro societies that would be uh, able uh, afterwards uh, uh, to connect to each other, might be a way of solving <laughs> not the big problem, but I don't know. Interesting. Um, I think James is time. This is the, this was the last question. So with uh, it was the know, last question freedom, and freedom. We, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now we I think we got five minutes. Maybe uh, we really need to start at, to stop at seven, but uh, or in uh, in eight minutes exactly. But uh, I think we got a few minutes for for question. Uh, I love the the comments about uh, um, reducing the the use of military. Uh, industrial metaphors i think it's really uh, i think it's not the, the first time that i read this but yeah of, of course we we use too much catalyst and boot camps like warriors and uh, and I, I think it's a really uh, good remark uh, uh, james do you want to manage uh, some question or to um... yeah i have a little look through the um through the board i'll ping some over when i find some <laughs> and in French, just Stéphane, tu as cinq minutes avant ton train. C'est ça, c'est ça. Merci, Mathias. Got a question from Erlab, which is kind of well, comment more than question, but it's about uh, 
kind of labs as safe places for a sort of trickle down innovation, which is kind of a play on the trickle down economics that some people think works. Um, not really sure what the question is necessarily, but interesting whether that's maybe a, a redundant approach of labs. Sorry, um, sorry, James, it's James Lewis from the lab here. So that was my thing. So just so we talk about innovation washing and we talk about innovation theatre when people turn up with boxes of post-it notes and don't want to have hard conversations. Similarly, just like trickle-down economics is largely thought to be defunct. Sometimes I think we're all a bit, we're all a, a bit guilty of believing in trickle-down innovation as an idea. Like, so long as we're innovating somewhere in the system and helping someone, then isn't that a good thing? Well, no, not necessarily. Not if you're increasing inequality by doing so. And so it's it's a, a plea to, to not be doing trickle-down innovation implicitly. That's what I meant by the comment. Mm -hmm. Any comments or the question? Um, maybe what what could be uh, because um, uh, meanwhile uh, uh, there are new labs every day. <laughs> uh, so what would would could be the advice we give to uh, and and the, another problem with that is that there are some labs who are starting now uh, they don't have all the story and there are all the labs who are uh, at the first level second level it's like in a game you know uh, uh, Lindsay calls uh, Lindsay talk about uh, version one version two version three uh, the main lab used to say he had eight lives um, so uh, it's it's progressive uh, but what could we tell to uh, to to labs now um, if they really want to uh, engage in a, um, in in a more um, robust and 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 um, in, um, create more impact, etc. I, mean, I I know it's a tricky question, and in a way you already answered. But uh, if you had one tip, Lindsay. <laughs> that's not fair um, I know it's not fair <laughs> I think there's this like, sort of interesting you, you, can, you can say read my thesis <laughs> yeah let's go read that I feel like um, I think maybe I'd take it back to this the, this idea of an ambitious theory of change and especially for those labs that do, that are in more privileged positions inside their organizations. You know, they've got a mayor or an elected official that's really behind them, um, or they've got a good budget or a good, you know, like, a, you know, decent enabling conditions, then really do your best to make the most of that with this more, with a more transformative approach to what it is that you're doing. Don't get caught in that, like theorize your work and, you know, take advantage of that opportunity to per really push paradigmatically. You know, you think about Danella Meadows and how she talks about points of intervening in the system. And when you're intervening in the rules and the mindsets and the paradigms and transforming paradigms end of changing systems, then you're likely to have more significant impact. So try it, don't lose sight of messing around in that space even if your job is to you know, find a solution per to a particular policy or service challenge um, as a lab, if you're tasked with that. Mm. Yeah. And I, um, um, I must admit that uh, um, the idea of, um, even if it looks like uh, something very basic, um, making the effort to write your own theory of transformation as a lab or is very helpful. I mean, we, uh, because of you, Lindsay, we did it uh, a few weeks ago uh, at La 27e Region. And it's very, um, it's very powerful because it's, uh, uh, you, you cannot lie in a way. I mean, you, you really got to uh, express um, what you want to do, uh, what is the utopia you want to you want to go, uh, in which direction you want to go, uh, how will you make it and, and prove it in a way. Uh, so it's it's really really um, really helpful. So I strongly suggest to uh, all those who uh, uh, we try to be more uh, explicit on their 
on what they on what they do on the way uh, where uh, they want to do it uh to 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 try this example you you have published this toolkit i think uh, a toolkit for um uh, for uh, for creating your own theory of transformation maybe we can uh, you can also share it it's in your blog but i, I think it's really uh, very useful towards which utopia are you traveling yeah yeah i think um utopia is very connected to what we said about new imaginaries I mean, if labs don't pursue utopia, what, what, what is good, what, what are there for if it's not for that? So yeah, I strongly believe we, we must uh, uh, build uh, and express our, our utopias. Uh, it's seven. Um, I think that is there is no question or if James, uh, if James uh, yeah, uh, we will we will publish it on uh, on our website our own theory of change and we will translate it in english james do you want to say bye bye or maybe uh, uh, say um, the next meeting for for work in progress come back to earth james no yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm on another planet now uh, thank you very much i found that very scintillating and interesting and i hope other people on the call did to um we have got another session later this evening for uh european night owls and everyone else just regular nice afternoon or morning times um on social r d what it is and how to kind of uh, nurture create make more of it um seems to kind of probably overlap quite a lot with what matthias was talking about with the kind of ecosystem metaphors um thank you massively uh stefan for bringing this together and comparing it and uh, thank you for I don't the take... invitation, James. Hey, no problem. Uh, no problem at all. Um, I don't want to take too much of your time up because you did say that you would miss your train to your holiday. Yeah. Uh, so you let's can go uh, on. roll the music. Do, do and, without uh, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll roll the music and say uh, thank you very much, bye -bye. everyone. Thank you to thank you, Lindsay and Matthias. Bye bye.